Thank you, Diedrich. Hi, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk ultrasound. Um, I have to uh, declare uh, ultrasound was my first baby, you know, 25 plus years ago, even actually more, nearly 30 years ago. God, I'm old. Um, and so I'll talk about ultrasound and GE, obviously the sponsors of this uh, symposium have just come out with a new machine that can do a, a semi-automated measurement of cardiac output. And it's all about flow. That's the key message. Go away thinking flow. OK, let me give you a quiz. Sorry, throwing, throwing the glass. Let me give you a quiz. So we have a patient after a cardiac arrest. He's 65 years old. He's tachycardic. He's hypotensive. He has a CVP of 8, a lactate of 5, wet-looking lungs. What are you going to do? Vote now. You haven't got any presents. OK, but it just highlights the, the, I would argue, the difficulty. Now, let me give you a bit more information. His cardiac output is 2 litres a minute, and there's evidence of hypovolemia. What are you going to give him? Fluid. Easy. Oh, now it becomes much easier. OK, now his cardiac output is still 2 litres a minute, but he looks well filled. Adequately filled. What are you going to give him? An inotrope, maybe a dilator. Now he looks overfilled. Two litres a minute. What are you going to do? He could try vasodilating. Finally, his cardiac output is actually 12 litres a minute. He's got a good going reperfusion injury. What are you going to go for? Fluid? No. Inotrope? No, he doesn't need it with 12 litres. A vasoconstrictor. So having that little bit of extra information has completely changed your management. So we need that to inform the right thing to do with the patient. We need a deeper understanding of physiology and a deeper measurement monitoring of physiology and it's one of the tragedies of uh, today's education and training that physiology is being relegated to uh, well to nothing and unfortunately we've got to try and bring back physiology to the bedside because if we understand physiology and a bit of biochemistry managing of the patient is actually much much easier I would argue so uh, this is the ICU there's me pondering, but we should use more than guesswork. We should actually use tools to guide the way we manage the patient. Who here thinks they're a good doctor? Hands up. None of you. I, I saw one hand go up and go down. <laughs> Is that insight or arrogance? So all of you think you're bad. Or you're too modest, maybe. But when you look in that mirror every morning and go, hey, I'm good. <laughs> well, we need to be fair. We need a certain degree of self-confidence to do the job we do. We have to make decisions. We have to pick a drug or a device or whatever to intervene. So we, we've got to believe in ourselves to do the right thing to the patient. Unfortunately... We're not very good. These are actually they're fairly old studies, but they use the long lost pulmonary artery catheter and they ask clinicians to assess in ICU patients, multi organ failure, critically ill, what they thought the cardiac output would be and the wedge pressure, the filling pressure. And you can see a toss of a coin would be better than a clinician. Oh, I've been doing this for 30 years, my boy. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. No. Connors showed the medical students were as good or as bad as the consultants. Oh dear. <laughs> it's com comforting, isn't it? This is a British study just looking at patients in heart failure after myocardial infarctions or whatever. So it's coronary care unit, 
single organ failure. And again, the clinician got it wrong on one in three occasions. And all of these studies show by having the extra information, in this case provided by the pulmonary artery catheter, change management in half the cases. Whether it makes a difference in outcome is a different matter, but at least the information was worrying enough to the clinician that they altered the way they were looking after the patient. The blood pressure, the heart rate, they're fairly useless. You know, you can have quite a severe low output state with a normal or even a high blood pressure because of vasoconstriction. On the other hand, especially if you're young, fit and healthy like me, you can drop your blood pressure, oh sorry, you can drop your cardiac output quite a long way. You can lose a lot of your circulating blood volume before you drop your blood pressure. On the other hand, that low blood pressure may also underlie a vasodilated state and often clinically you can actually get it wrong. You think they're shut down but actually there's this inner central hyperdynamic circulation. Tachycardia, it tells you something's not right with the patient, they're stressed, it doesn't tell you what. So we need better monitoring. And I'll touch briefly on the fact I think a dynamic challenge to the circulation is much better than a static measure. So one of my heroes, I'm going to show you three of my heroes. So this guy is a guy called Starling. What was his first name? No, it wasn't Frank. That was a German. <laughs> You've got the E. The dead word. Yeah, everyone says Frank. There's a German around the same time. And he worked where I work now, University College London. So uh, I work with a guy who's a physiologist who has the Starling lab. It's a shrine. You can touch the wall. <sighs> Starling was here. And it's really useful. You can dig out his papers. A hundred years ago, and nothing's changed. Amazing, you know, what he was saying there. His is just one. His, actually, his original Starling curve, but as you can see, it's slightly changed the other way with cardiac output on the x-axis. And he points out that, yep, you can get this relationship, you know, the venous pressure shoots up, but the cardiac output can improve and then decrease. You know, so again, he showed it many, many years ago. And we can do that, again, with ultrasound. So the area of that flow velocity waveform gives you an approximate of stroke volume. And you can do a fluid challenge looking at the response until they're no longer going up that curve. So provided the patient remains fluid responsive and there's a need to give more fluid, you can titrate. You don't want to drown the patient, but you want to give them enough fluid. You can use the shape of the waveform to give you a lot of information. So if you reduce preload, the flow time, which can be corrected to heart rate, gets narrower. And if it's narrow and you give fluid, it gets wider. So the predominant effect when you're changing preload is on the width rather than the height. On the other hand, when you have myocardial depression, the peak velocity goes down. And when you give an inotrope, increased oomph the peak velocity goes up. And again, there are age-dependent levels for peak velocity, so you know what's normal for a person of that age. And changing afterload ooh, has an effect on both. So when you increase afterload, that left ventricle has to pump against a higher resistance, so the waveform gets narrower and shorter. And when you reduce afterload, the heart's got less resistance to pump against, you get a much better looking stroke volume because there's less resistance to flow. So go back to Starling so we can obviously do the Starling curve type approach, give fluid challenges and make sure we're still going up the Starling curve and when we're not, unless the patient's bleeding out more than we're putting the fluid in, generally we can look at responsiveness. This is another of my heroes, hero number two, a guy called Sarnoff. Nobody talks about but Sarnoff came up with the idea of compliance curves. So for the same stroke volume, or the same filling pressure rather, you can have very different stroke volumes depending on the stiffness of the heart. And again, he did some very elegant work, 1955. And here, Guyton, also around the same time, showed 
damaged myocardium, a normal starling type curve, and this sympathetic stimulation. So again, for the same right atrial pressure, you get very, very different measures of cardiac output. So just looking at the stroke volume, sorry, at the CVP, isn't that helpful. You need to challenge and learn a lot more from a dynamic intervention and see how that heart responds. One of the problems of when you don't measure flow is you think you're doing the right thing, but you're often actually doing harm. This is something we did, oh, 1991. I was incredibly young. <laughs> incredibly, incredibly young. And we gave, we were doing Doppler ultrasound, and we were doing in human volunteers, we gave a whole load of different challenges. We gave dibutamine, we took up to a litre of fluid off, we gave phenylephrine, we gave metaraminol. Really interesting phentolamine to vasodilate them and looking at the change, the effect on blood pressure on these shapes of the waveform. So methoxamine and metaraminol. Methoxamine is a, a purer alpha agonist. Metaraminol is actually structurally related to norepinephrine. So it actually vasoconstricts, but it has some inotropic effect as well. But you can see the effect going up and up and on the dose. So we gave a little bolus and, or infusion and then went up and up on the dose. You can see that the blood pressure came up with the methoxamine, came up a lot more with the metaraminol, but look what it did to cardiac output. And these are healthy volunteers. So we're poisoning them if they have a low cardiac output with a drug that, oh, haven't we done well? We put the blood pressure up, but at what cost to the circulation, to the flow? Again, 1991, These are, this is in a patient. Before and after metaraminol, this is somebody having cardiac surgery. It halved the cardiac output. That you can see the waveform halves in size. But the blood pressure came up. Mm. I'd suggest that blood pressure is certainly not everything. Flow is key, paramount. So go dynamic. That'll wake you up. Do a physiological challenge, whether it's fluid, a dilator, a postural change, propofol is a good way of looking at a, a hemodynamic challenge, change CPAP or whatever, ventilator settings. Do a challenge and look at the before and after effect. Um, so again, this is again the new venue system, and again, you can look at trends, you can look at changes, and you can measure there in the uh, left ventricular outflow tract, and it, it sort of can give you a measure of cardiac output. So summary, so I've blown up flow, but we'll keep it inflated, won't we? So flow monitoring, I would argue, is fundamental in appreciating an unstable circulation. It aids diagnosis, it directs management. To do it without the flow monitoring is, in my eyes, tantamount to a crime because you don't know what's going on, you're guessing. And as I showed you earlier, you're often guessing wrong. So you must know when, how, and in whom to use any device. I think one of the problems of the devices that don't measure flow, they derive it often from pressure, and so you put the pressure up with your vasoconstrictor and it says the flow is going up when it's actually going down. So you've got to know how the device works and the limitations. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for this enthusiastic uh, presentation are there, and, and dynamic. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? If not, maybe I can start. Um, I fully agree that flow is much more important than pressure, but still it's very difficult at the bedside. What are you doing or in your hospital? What is then the best well, way to we measure? Use, in fact, our nurses use Doppler. So it, you don't need to wait for a doctor to come. You know, obviously you train the people. It's actually quite a quick, you're talking about learning curve earlier. It's actually pretty quick to teach people how to do it. And so you can get in there early. You know, you, and when you're worried about the patient, you can have a much more accurate feel as to, as I used in my example, do I give flow, do I give a presser, what do I do? 
Oh, sorry, do I get flow? Do I get fluid uh, or a presser or what do I do? So, so I would argue it is actually readily achievable. You can do it with Echo, you can do it with standalone Doppler. There are lots of ways of doing it. Even the good old-fashioned pulmonary artery catheter, I think, still has a potential role. It's gone out of fashion, perhaps sadly, because I think it does still have a use, but it's currently uh, waiting a rebirth. Okay, and, and that means that you, when you um, have hypotension, your advice is you should measure yeah. uh, cardiac output in, in a way because then you can make the right decision. That, that would be my argument, yes, absolutely. Fully agree, okay. Uh, thank you, Mervin. So now I have three heroes, Starling, Starnoff, Sna Sarnoff, and, and yourself. <laughs> <laughs> It was the third one. <laughs> <laughs> You're very sweet. <laughs> Lovely. Isn't so, uh, a, a short question. I suspect that you love very, very much that the hemodynamic monitoring uh, can be continuous. Mm. So, my question is how continuous is the esophageal Doppler? Yeah, so it varies from patient to patient. In the ideal world, you know, you put it down, leave it, and it'll be hands off. Um, it's not. So in some patients it is, but in many patients it isn't. But again, you've got the probe there, you can make a few changes so fairly quickly. Literally, the nurses are very good at doing it. Within a minute or two, they refine the signal. So in the ideal world, clever technology, you would track, you know, um, all right, if there is any movement of the probe, you would track, you know, where the aorta lies, because the aorta, the descending thoracic aorta, sits literally a centimeter away, the wall from the esophagus so clever technology could be able to track it but I agree with you that you know is the frustration that it's not 100% continuous but so at least it's there and you can monitor. So we would agree that this is a continuous discontinuous uh, monitoring. <laughs> yeah it's continuously discontinuous <laughs> or discontinuously continuous yeah. depends which way but completely. Okay one question from the floor. Going in the same direction actually um, for you know, the regular intensive care physician who believes in volume responsiveness or dynamic assessment. In your opinion, what's the most practical and at the same time most reliable monitor to do that? Yeah, I'm Maybe biased. also yeah. a comment on, uh, you know, the bioimpedance monitors that we have, which are very simple to use. Yeah, the, my big problem, I'll upset some of the if there's any bioimpedance fans or people in the company. But my big problem is the reliability of a lot of these devices. You know, there's a lot of extrapolation. And so it works in a healthy person. As Jean-Louis once said, and I think it was quite funny, you can create an empty black box, put an LED display saying five litres per minute, and, oh, look, it's five litres, that fits. You know, and so I think, again, it's the reliability of the device. So in a healthy unstressed individual, you know, they'll be around five litres per minute. But what we really want to know is when that patient is very stressed, how reliable is the monitor in all situations? And so clearly, and no device is perfect, there's always going to be a, a challenging situation, but it's a case of the awareness. You know, I gave the example of vasopressors. I would argue that unless you're looking at flow, no device looking at vasopressors Oh, sorry, no device looking at a non-flow parameter is going to be accurate when you're giving a vasopressor. You, you know, so th that would be my particular bias, and I think the literature would support me. So I think if you are using other devices, fine, but know their limitations. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very Marvin. much indeed. So we move on uh, with uh, Professor Jean-Daniel Schisch. 